Welcome to the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast for club owners, operators, and fitness professionals. Each week, host Brian O'Rourke brings you an expert interview with a global influencer at the crossroads of fitness and technology. You gain the insights, tools, and inspiration you need to stay connected to the pulse for what matters most for your business in the age of exponential technologies. Welcome, listeners, and thanks for joining us at the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast. I am your host, Brian O'Rourke, and um, I hope your July is going well. It is hot as Hades here in the southern United States, Uh, so thanks for taking a few minutes uh, uh, to listen in on our guest in the interview today. I hope uh, you are holding up all right through all the changes going on, the um, various clubs reopening, the use of technology, and what's happening in the industry, and so today I thought it would be great to have a longtime friend and colleague, Darren Allen, on the show. Um, For those of you that don't know Darren, uh, his background um, has been in the club business uh, since uh, the mid-90s. So he's been in the industry space for 25 years or more, uh, working as a general manager for Health and Fitness Connection, and then Osteopathic Health Systems of Texas, where he was the vice president and executive director. And then uh, with his partner, uh, started a visual fitness planner in around 2000, um, uh, you know, so that was 20 years ago. And they did some pretty interesting stuff with point of sale support for personal trainings and more recently with their VFP Next product, which is a CRM. So I thought today we would chat with Darren, having been in the business a long time, about what challenges uh, he, see club, he sees club owners have when it comes to technology adoption, uh, automation, CRM, etc. cetera. Um, really happy to have uh, Darren join us. I hope you enjoy the podcast. If I can be of any help to you or you have any feedback on the podcast, don't hesitate to find me at Brian K. O'Rourke or Brian K. O'Rourke at gmail.com. So without further ado, let's join uh, Darren in our interview. Well, listeners, as I said in the introduction, I've known this guy for quite a long time. In fact, my partner, Robert Dyer, who you all have heard of before, he's been on the podcast. He's known Darren for even longer than that. Darren, thank you for making time to uh, visit with me and for our listeners. How are you doing? Mr. Brian O'Rourke, I am doing great. Thank you so much for having me on. Everything is uh, going really well. Fantastic. Well, you know, you're such a class act, as I said in the intro, and I always love your Christmas cards with the family and the wife. They're the most beautiful Christmas pictures. I love those. Uh, But, you know, over the years, um, I know we've had the opportunity to chat, and you've been, as an operator in the technology side, in the health club gym space for many, many years, although you look like you're about 28, Um, you know. um, So you have a perspective, I think a pretty good perspective, uh, when it comes to you know, what has happened over the last couple of decades in technology, you've seen a lot happen. So tell, tell us and the listeners a little bit about that. Where, where did you start at and where are we today? And then we'll get into some more challenges that are happening today. So tell, tell the listeners a little bit about that. Yeah, very good. Well, uh, you know, I've, I've been at it so long, we won't say how long that's been, but one of the early, early challenges, this to give you an idea of how long it's been, uh, one of the early challenges was, um, you know, you couldn't, there was like literally no interconnectivity, no internet connectivity. The speeds were just literally terrible. I mean, some, some old dial up modems, Brian, I mean, it was really challenging. And so bandwidth was an issue uh, in those early days. We obviously had a lot of early adopters uh, for our technology. Uh, and we worked through a whole bunch of stuff, but in those early days, it was literally fighting against paper, uh, and, and the fact that, uh, technology seemed so much more invasive, uh, in, into the health and fitness club operation in that space. Um, and, and in those early days, there were also, uh, not, there was not nearly as much noise. Um, you would have, you know, maybe some new technology that would come in um, and you would have some early adopters and you would have a little bit of time. We had, a, you know, the blessing of some time to, to build the business and then, and then move from the early adopters on to others. Um, but certainly 
you know, even having computers, you know, video graphics cards that could handle our technology was a challenge. Uh, and so we overcame a bunch of that stuff. But early on, um, I mean, I can remember there were a lot of uh, technology companies that you know were allowed to progress over time there are also a bunch that just sort of came and went right you'd go to ursa and it'd be like where was that those other guys they're gone right um and and so but but it's really challenging today for club operators in my opinion because there are so many new technologies flooding the marketplace and and hitting our space and sometimes they they start within our space sometimes they come from outside of our space and and for a club operator, it's like, you don't, how do I know, you know, what is their history? What is their partnership mentality? Um, what is their backing? Like, what's their bandwidth? And, and are they going to be around? So it's, it's a really challenging environment today. So it's, it's changed significantly from in the past, if you would be willing to um, sort of invest and spend time with a partner and, and, you know, go through a few bumps and invest in some infrastructure technology you, you're probably going to be okay now boy if the operators if they choose the wrong you know technology then they have to start all over in so many different ways yeah dynamically change yeah it has and and with that have come a lot of challenges i know and i'm i, I want to talk to you about these like when i talk to club operators and advise them on their technology roadmaps many of them don't have a technology roadmap uh, even even some significant brands don't really have a technology roadmap or they are operating, you know, eight, 10, 14 pseudo siloed systems uh, where, you know, and so their ability to do certain things is very uh, restricted. And, and so uh, what do you see today as, as challenges that you see a lot of uh, operators facing? Well, you know, it's interesting, Brian, I mean, it sort of goes to what I just mentioned in that you have a bunch of these technologies that come and they may solve for this one really narrow, you know, problem or this opportunity that you see, um, but they can't scale, they can't expand outside of that or they don't, they don't connect. And, and we actually have been talking about the multi-system madness that's what we call it multi-system madness and you're right that tech stack it may be 8 10 12 different companies um, some of them uh, you know have you know an api or they say that they have a really you know open api when you know you dig in and find out actually it's it's actually not really very open it's not very robust they only have one endpoint or two it's just it's a real challenge and so to, to me i think that the most important thing for uh, a club operator today is when they choose a technology partner, they need to make sure that they choose a, a partner that they can commit to uh, for a, a, a long period of time. I mean, they don't have to feel like they're stuck, but they just need to know that they have a partnership mentality that they're going to work together to craft the future. And it has to be, in, in my opinion, like, you know, our newest technology, it has to be API first, in my opinion. Um, you can't have any closed environment systems. It's just going to lead to a dead end uh, and you'll have to start over. But definitely that multi-system madness, um, you know, having, you know, maybe the bright, shiny new thing, you know, that with that company. But it, again, they they are not looking further out with their roadmap. They're not looking further out for the, the greater uh, good of the industry. Um, and, and so many times they are having to just run so fast on their development treadmill uh, that they can't even handle, you know, little detours uh, that, that may come up for, you know, one of the club operator businesses. So uh, having some depth, um, some, some, you know, width within their the technology development team, uh, resource, all that sort of stuff is pretty important. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's still even with that, it's challenging because you make it that it's challenging. I think we were talking about this before um, uh, because it's about change. And a lot of the challenge with technology is we were chatting about, it's the technology has its own things you need to make sure of. But when you're talking about changing how organizations function using technology tools, you know, you, get, you, get, you start getting into people and process and what they're used to and what they don't want to do or what they do do. And that's why you often see these technology projects and adoptions fail or not really reach their potential. Have you experienced that? 
Absolutely. And, and so many times, you know, that change management, uh, people can only handle so much change at one time and uh, work together um, and to really get the, the solutions that they need for those clubs working together well and seamlessly. Uh, because, you know, what you may end up having is if you've got that eight, 10, 12 different things, the rate of change with technology is so fast. And then you have the, the staff turnover that you could be training them. How in the world can you train all of your, your employees with staff turnover on eight, 10, 12 different systems with the rate of change? It's, it's, literally, it's literally impossible. And so you want to make sure that you have fewer systems that have deeper talking points, deeper API connectivity, so that there's a little bit less change management. Uh, and then it becomes, instead of training on all of the change on all the different platforms, it becomes the, the employees, the, the staff members are like, oh man, I wish this technology could do this. And so then a company like ours that has a great roadmap and they are you know, doing constant releases of, of new innovation that is coming from the needs and the requests from all the staff, then it's just a natural learning cycle. It's a lot easier change management, you know, having fewer, um, you know, technologies in your stack, um, and then, you know, partnering with a company that is developing to your needs. Yep, exactly. And I, I tell you, sitting down, I did a round table up in the, the Northeast at the nurse event. We had about, we had some good folks uh, there, uh, some really good folks that I've known for a while. There were probably a dozen clubs, a number of them really, you know, larger multi-purpose facilities and some others. But, you know, the question was for them around tech was, uh, you know, we need to do something. All right. What, what do you need to do? Like, what's, what do you need to do? Well, you know, well, and they'll tell you all their challenges, right? Um, well, this, this doesn't work this way or that doesn't work this way or like, you know, so, and they're thinking about it through the lens of a vendor. Well, this vendor contacted me and they can do this, or this one contacted me. And, and, you know, I'm like, you know, look, you're going to have, you have to do an assessment and a prioritization and a roadmap and understand what everything is you're doing now and why, and, and what makes sense from not only the standpoint of, you know, customers and members and what they expect now, but also how you want to run your business. And that's not something that, you know, uh, is easy to do. It, it takes effort. And like we were talking about earlier, you know, the other thing around tech I find is that the expectation level of technology to solve those problems is really out of line with the reality of the fact that you have to have a lot of things figured out. So you pick the right technology in a partnership way. So it actually works out for your company versus seeing something because it's cool that day that you see it or you're reacting to a problem with a specific thing that doesn't do this or that. And you're not really, do you, do you see that with clients a lot? Oh, it, it, it's something we see all the time and, and our most successful customers, what they have done is they have said, Hey, let's approach this from getting our foundation in place. And in, in, in our company, we actually have, you know, you mentioned we've been around for a while. We actually had the luxury of, after, you know, we made a bunch of mistakes, right? And, and we fought and scraped and scratched and clawed and made it. So then about four and a half years ago, we said, let's just take a, a, a pause here and let's build our foundation of our new technology stack exactly the way it needs to be built, the best base foundation. And then from there, you now can add things. And so I think clubs need to look at this in a similar way. They need to make sure they've got a really good foundation and they need to look at every technology that they do through a lens of, okay, this may solve a problem, but is this going to silo, um, you know, a bunch of data or is this going to silo, um, you know, a process or is this going to, you know, create issues. And so our philosophy, and we have a new brand new customer, you know, launching right now, that uh, had a challenge, they brought that challenge to us, their solution would have really started like a whole new tentacle in their business. Right. Whereas by them coming to us, we can solve for that in the short term and then have a plan for the bigger term. Right. Um, 
that won't involve multiple other tentacles of stranded data, siloed systems that, that don't talk to each other. Yeah, and you really need that integration more and more to be able to do things like marketing automation, uh, getting data insight that really is actionable versus, oh, we got to run a report here, oh, we got to do that, we gotta, and then someone's got to manually do this and that. And today, <clears throat> that's not the best case scenario for operators, right? <laughs> it is far from the best case. And, and, and they shouldn't have to be running around like that. Um, because, you know, what I see is the future uh, is uh, having so much data that they're not going to know what to do with it unless they actually implement systems that can then automatically communicate or, you know, give them the information that they need, the insight that they need off of the data and then what they need to do with that data and then actually begin to automate. Um, the the responses to right. what the data is telling you whereas so much of the stuff today is well i've got like you said i got to pull this report and it doesn't have everything i need in it so then i got to compare it to that report and you know it, it's it's part of it is just what happens over time yep. but the future of having so much of that automated is is coming and but you better have your tech stack yep. right where you you're going to be way behind your competitor that, that's exactly right. And then, and it's very human in, in what it, these things enable, which is, you know, identifying, uh, you know, customer segments by their needs. Uh, you know, you all have done a lot of sales enablement uh, in, with your new products. I know you do a lot of marketing automation, other things, but it's being able to learn from the data, provide these members a better onboarding experience, provide them a better service experience that matches their needs, learn from that data over time with cohorts that you, that you analyze, and getting better and better at selling and, and retaining people in a way that's meaningful to them instead of being generic, right? That's one key underpinning to the benefit of this stuff. Yeah, there's no question. And, and so we actually gather some of the most comprehensive data through our onboarding uh, system. And, and now with our automation and member engagement automation, we now can leverage all of those data points to really support what the, the true business strategies of the health club industry is. And I think that that's key because we, we've been around long enough, we understand you're still got to drive to, you know, what are my new sales and, you know, what are my, you know, how much PT penetration, small group training, like what, what am I doing all my ancillary revenues and my targets? You've got to keep all of that in mind. And so all the data that we're gathering is actually designed to help them drive extra sales and revenue, but it's also now um, combined with our automation engagement. You can now really communicate um, in a really rich way, and that communication can go very deep based on their goals, based on their check-in history, based on their usage, based on the you know now based on their results over time. Uh, their, or their lack of results. You combine lack of results with, you know, a missed, you know, a, a dip in their check-in history or something. All of a sudden, that is a new message. That's new communication. And then you're not waiting until the person's, you know, annual number of visits has decreased. Yep, that's a retention thing. And when I talk in my speak, uh, speaking engagements around personalization, that's a great example. When I talk about the execution engines being enterprise platforms, which is what we're talking about, uh, talking about automation, talking about data. Those are the key things in human capital, of course, great people. Um, those are exact examples of what I've been talking about the last number of years, because how hard is it going to be to compete if you don't have that capability, Darren? I'm, well, I don't think that you'll, to be honest with you, I don't think that you'll survive if, if you don't have these capabilities, because your competitors are going to have these and they are going to leverage and maximize a tech stack that has fewer providers in it and that has a, a great UI for their human capital, for their, for their people, because the UI is really key, uh, especially in where we are right now today, you're going to have fewer staff members. Yep. And so the need for 
really smooth, amazing UI that your fewer people can leverage to greater capacity uh, is absolutely key. And that's one of the reasons why we invested so heavily in this CRM member engagement. It's not just sales, right? It's not just, oh, how do we, you know, right. drive some leads and do some lead management. It is truly uh, a, a fully comprehensive enterprise CRM that you can see the get a holistic view of your members and leads, certainly, but all of it so that you can really be communicating um, and retain, retaining your members because, um, you know, it, it, it's so competitive out there right now. But if you don't have this in place, you're really going to struggle, in my opinion. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's about just creating a better member experience. So people feel like you understand who they are. You know, they, they, they feel like you're trying to take care of them. They, you know, that, that's, that's important because even if you lose some of them, the, the, the facts are their sense of, of appreciation is going to be better. Their, you know, your NPS is going to be better. All these things will, will convert to better, uh, better numbers. And, and a lot of people ask me, Darren, what does enterprise mean? And so I, you know, I, I know what I think about it. You know, it's it's a widely used term. I use it, but um, what is your view of that term? My view of enterprise means that it is multi-location. It is um, not only do you have your sort of your site and, and, and the ability to have all of your regions within your sites and then your districts within your regions and then all of your club locations and then all of your staff. And, and not only does does the technology have the ability to segment all the way down like that? So you have multi levels of reporting and all that sort of stuff, but that all of your data and everything is all still yet all at the site level. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's got to be something that scales across hundreds to thousands of locations. Um, and that you have this single user, you know, your single sign on so that you can sign on and, and then your people can go in and look at everything. You don't have to say, oh, well, you know, I, I can't access this or that. No, you, you get access uh, to the, the entire stack. And then you have all sorts of different permission levels. So you can determine which staff get access to what. And then all of your security. Um, today, security is a real key issue. And so you want to ensure uh, that your security is is dialed in. So all of those things go into what I would call enterprise. But I would also say that your API layer uh, yeah. has to be clearly integrated, cleanly integrated into the infrastructure of how you built the entire I thing. Think. That's right. Because if you try to bolt on sort of some, you know, web services and, and bolt on, you know, oh, let me just add this, you know, access point over here that's not sort of integrated into the fabric of your enterprise technology system, then you're going to be limited over time. Yeah. And a, a, a nuance that we talked about privately, um, and I won't get into details except to say this, one of the nuances around that for a lot of especially larger uh, chains or regional brands is going to be who owns the data and who wants to share the data where and how and who's trying to charge for that data <laughs> who's trying to you know because that's a whole other thing that's going to start emerging which heretofore that wasn't as big of a deal i think it's going to become a bigger deal would you agree with that uh, there is no question that it's going to become a bigger deal and and interestingly it may end up being the consumer that uh, ultimately weighs in and determine who wins this battle, right? But but for, for today, um, the consumer and the club, you know, our opinion is it's their data. Um, you know, obviously you can do some different things with aggregated data and all that sort of stuff. But, um, uh, you know, with all the data security, and there are a bunch of new laws too that, that are coming in, you know, oftentimes led by California, um, but the, the consumers got the, got the you know, uh, they, own, they own their data, they can control what's happening with that uh, to a great extent. But now certainly as they sign away their rights to all that data, um, then who can do what with it, who owns it is key. And so I would just encourage those clubs to make sure that they understand uh, that they need to own any data that they can own on their on their members. Yeah, another thing we talked about, uh, um, and I'm going a little off subject with you, Darren. I'm sorry, but another thing we talked about uh, before 
is the notion of payment and how that relates to data and all that because you know the payment gateways you know as you know if you're a chase customer and your your business that you're transacting with is a chase business you can transact at zero cost so you're, you're going to see a lot more things and i think that's where when you think of payment which used to be with eft and other a big component of member management right where more and more as that becomes more ubiquitous in how people can transact, that changes a lot of dynamics too, right? Yeah, there's no question. I mean, you're seeing so many new uh, uh, and, and API first sort of payment system. You know, you got your Stripe, you got all, you get so many different things, and um, it is commoditizing all of that. And so, therefore, you know you have a lot more technology that is maybe a little bit less focused on payment uh, because you can plug and play different payment systems. Now, that doesn't mean that the fee structures are where I think that they're going to go. I think it's going to continue to, you know, to, uh, to change over time. We'll have to see exactly where that goes and, and who gets the fees and how that works. But um, it is dynamically changing uh, today for sure. Yeah, and it's all about customer choice, you know, as I show you my my uh, Apple watch, you know, with the new uh, iOS with 14 that's coming out with watch and everything. So all that stuff continues to evolve. Well, Darren, again, so thankful to have you on the podcast. I've been chasing Darren down, but he's usually too occupied between his role at VFP or being a great dad. Um, so it's hard to wrangle you, Darren. Any other words of wisdom for our listeners as we kind of wrap this up? Um, you know, I, I don't know if it's a word of wisdom, but it is a uh, motivational, exciting uh, quote that I heard from Doc Rivers. Um, and I just loved it because, you know, this has been a, a pretty trying year, right? Yep. Um, and so uh, basically he was saying, hey, look, everybody, it's only halftime. I know it's been tough, but we're going to go out there and we are going to absolutely crush the second half. And so I'll just encourage everybody to sort of put behind them uh, as much as they can, what sort of challenges that they've had uh, and look to see how that they can, you know, win the second half of this year. But I would also say that if, if they have an opportunity at all to ensure that their foundation of their technology is, is, is gonna set them up for success in the future, there's really no better time than right now for them to do that um and 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 then good luck that's really it that's brilliant doc rivers crushing the second half i love that darren i love it you know we, we try to stay away from the uh the coronavirus you know subject i have a little bit of it up in the intro but i think it is pertinent what you're saying is very wise um and probably a lot of operators today and business people today in general are are thinking about the very point you raised because um you know the more you're prepared to meet the customer of the future and of today the more able you're going to be to you know have your business succeed and, and health club the gym and the long run so foundation is critical darren thank you so much i really appreciate your time i know the listeners are going to really enjoy this one these pearls of wisdom we appreciate all that you do and thanks uh thanks for being uh being here this afternoon man well, Brian O'Rourke, I appreciate you, sir, so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Hello, listeners. This is Brian O'Rourke, and thanks so much for listening to the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast. The podcast is made possible by the Fitness Industry Technology Council, a consortium of global brands working together to enhance the adoption of technologies in the fitness space. Our company, Videri Ventures, which is invested in Vertimax, Matazumo, Gold's Gym, Houston, Texas, and Fitness 24-7 Thailand, also underwrites the podcast, along with our service companies, Integris Advisors, Moon Mission Media, and others. Please feel free to share this podcast with your colleagues. And if I can be of any assistance to you, don't hesitate to reach out, brianklerorke at gmail.com or find me on any of the major social networks. Have a great day and thanks for listening.